I'm Larry Walther. This is principlesofaccounting.com, Chapter 17. In this module, we will consider the categories that are unique to inventory for a manufacturing concern, as well as the related financial statement implications. First, recall from your previous studies that a company would carry an inventory account for goods that are held and available for resale to others. That inventory account would appear on the balance sheet and when those goods are sold, that cost would be transferred from inventory on the balance sheet into the cost of goods sold on the income statement. We have similar considerations for a manufacturer, except that we have three categories of inventory. The first category is our raw materials. Now these are the components that are to be used in the manufacturer products. They are the raw materials. The second category is the work and process category. Those are goods in production but are not yet complete. The work and process inventory account carries accumulated costs of direct materials, direct labor, and manufacturing overhead. All of those costs are accumulated and carried in work and process. And when the work and process is completed and goods are transferred into the final category of inventory, that's the finished goods category. It's the completed goods that are awaiting sale to others. So what we would have on a balance sheet then for a manufacturer either directly on the face of the balance sheet or in the related notes would be an indication of the three categories of inventory. Let's next consider how these costs are processed in the financial statements of a manufacturer. Here I have a schedule of raw materials for Katrina's trinkets and it shows how much of the available raw material supply was transferred into production during a particular period. We begin with beginning inventory of raw materials, that category of inventory to which we add the net purchases of raw material for the period, which gives us the raw materials available for use, and from which we subtract our ending inventory, finally resulting in the raw materials that are transferred into the next category of inventory, which is work in process. So remember this number, 595,000 for Katrina's trinkets. It is the result of these calculations. The goods that are transferred out of raw materials inventory also appear in the next schedule, an inventory schedule of calculations for work in process. This schedule of work in process shows the conversion cost that were added to the raw materials that were transferred in. Adding to that our cost of production, direct labor, and factory overhead that was assigned for the period. So Katrina incurred for this year 1,200,000 of additional manufacturing cost Added to that would be the beginning work in process inventory and subtracted from that would be the ending work in process inventory to give us the amount cost of goods manufactured and that amount would be transferred into the finished goods inventory. We'll look in a moment at the finished goods inventory but sometimes companies will combine these two schedules into a combined schedule of cost of goods manufactured. And here you can see a repeat of the schedule of raw materials. Beginning raw materials plus purchases minus ending raw materials gives us the raw materials transferred into production, 595,000. And to that, we'll add our beginning work in process inventory and subtract our ending work in process inventory to find the $1 million cost of goods manufactured. Again, this schedule of cost of goods manufactured is merely a combining of the previous two schedules. So now let's see how we calculate cost of goods sold for Katrina's trinkets. We have the beginning finished goods inventory to which we add the $1 million cost of goods manufactured. That gives us goods available for sale of $1,250,000 and we subtract from that, I've assumed 190,000 of ending inventory and we come up with the cost of goods sold which is transferred to the income statement. So remember the 1,060,000 is the cost of goods sold and if we look at an income statement here we see once again sales minus the cost of goods sold that we just calculated, 1,060,000 to get our gross profit from which we subtract our other selling general administrative costs to come up with the net income. And this uh, is quite similar in appearance to income statements we saw in previous chapters for merchandising concerns. Let's review our cost flow concepts to this point. We have three manufacturing costs, the materials, the labor, and the overhead. Those costs, as they are incurred and transferred into work in process, they're transferred into the work in process account. To the extent those goods are completed, the completed goods are transferred into finished goods. 
To the extent the work in process is not complete at the end of an accounting period, it would appear on the balance sheet as work in process inventory. To the extent it is completed, however, in finished goods, we need to evaluate whether it's been sold, in which case it's transferred to cost of goods sold, or to the extent it remains as goods available for sale, it would be carried as finished goods inventory on the balance sheet. Unrelated to the manufacturing cost is the non-manufacturing cost, administrative salary, selling expenses and the like. Those costs are not blended in with work in process. They are instead transferred in to the income statement as selling general and administrative expenses for the period. And so to review then, our cost related to inventory could wind up on the balance sheet as work in process inventory, finished goods, or we could also have raw materials that have not yet been put into process. The other cost, however, that I'm showing are attributable to cost of goods sold or selling general and administrative expenses. Let's think critically about how this operates. One tends to think of depreciation as an expense, depreciation expense for the period, but is it always an expense? Let's think about this with an example in a manufacturing setting. Assume we have total depreciation for the period of $500,000. 300,000 of that relates to the manufacturing facilities and 200,000 relates to the corporate offices. Also, of the goods that have been entered into production, one-third is still in production, one-third is finished awaiting sale to customers, and the final third has actually been sold to customers. So let's see how this operates on our graph. If you can look closely, I'm showing in the manufacturing overhead block $300,000 of depreciation and I'm showing in the non-manufacturing block $200,000 of depreciation. The non-manufacturing depreciation flows across to the income statement and is included in selling general and administrative expenses. However, the $300,000 that was placed into work in process, one-third of that is still in work in process at the end of the period. So that 100000 of depreciation would actually become an inventoryable cost and included in the work in process accounts. The other 200000 was transferred to finished goods. One third of the total, or 100000 of that, remains in finished goods inventory and one third is transferred to cost of goods sold. So back to the question, is the 300000 of depreciation all expense? And we can look and see, no, indeed, 200000 of it is still in inventory. 100000 in work in process and 100000 in finished goods. The other 300000 was charged to expense as cost of goods sold and selling general and administrative costs. Hopefully this concept illustrates the cost flow for a manufacturer, how the costs are accumulated in inventory and eventually transferred to expense in the income statement. Finally, let me close this module by suggesting that a company's results of operations are very sensitive to proper cost assignment. If we don't allocate cost appropriately to manufacturing or non-manufacturing or to raw materials or working process or finished goods, we can have significantly erroneous financial statements. Recognize that much of the direct material, direct labor and factory overhead cost can end up in inventory at the end of a period. Indeed, the Financial Accounting Standards Board has addressed this with reporting rules requiring the allocation of overhead to inventory. For U.S. tax purposes, there are also specific uniform capitalization rules that specify how much cost must be allocated to inventory rather than to expense for a particular period of time. In subsequent chapters, we're going to look at analysis techniques that seemingly violate these rules, but for internal purposes we may do alternative forms of analysis by separating our cost into fixed and variable components, for example, that will allow us better insight into the decision-making process for a business.